And we're going to spend some time together this evening looking at what the Bible uh, teaches us about being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. To see what a disciple is and what is expected of a disciple. To look at the Bible's clear explanation of some key principles involved, I suppose, in discipleship. And to then agree what it should mean to each one of us. So let's start out with a basic definition, if we may. A disciple is a follower of the doctrines of a teacher or a particular school of thought. So throughout history, and even today, there have been and there are uh, those who have taught and those who follow. So, for example, Karl Marx was a teacher of political doctrines, and he had lots of followers who described themselves as Marxists. In the lifetime of, I think, all of us here, um, Margaret Thatcher, the late Margaret Thatcher, is credited with having moulded a set of political and economic doctrines which attracted the description of Thatcherism. And those who subscribed to her ideas and followed her teaching in that sense, they are referred to, I think, as Thatcherites. So not just in the world of politics is this true, because we could find a similar idea about disciples in the same sense in the worlds of art or music or literature or science or philosophy and so on. And in each context, the basic definition with which we began there is confirmed. Each disciple is someone who follows the ideas or the teachings or the beliefs or the style of their teacher in whatever the context happens to be. So that must form the foundation for our thoughts about disciples of Jesus Christ. Because he was undoubtedly a great teacher, perhaps the world's greatest teacher, many would say. And during his lifetime on earth, which was a relatively very short period of time, he attracted a large number of disciples, some of whom in particular were referred to as apostles. You might like just to note that an apostle in this context is defined as someone who has been with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from the time of John's baptism, the beginning of the gospel as it is called, to the ascension of Jesus into heaven after his resurrection from death. Someone therefore who was acquainted with the whole period of Jesus Christ's ministry, the work that he had done, and of course he must specifically be someone who was a witness of the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. So if we understand that, we see the distinction between disciples on the one hand and apostles on the other, and we recognise that whilst we can all be disciples of Jesus Christ in this sense, we can never be apostles because we didn't witness that situation. Now, I want us to go to the Bible, and we're going, first of all, to the only mention of the word disciple in the Old Testament. Uh, Some people are surprised that it's actually there in the Old Testament at all. But it is, it's in the prophecy of Isaiah and in chapter 8. So if we could just turn there briefly, uh, we'll we'll see the only mention of the word in the Old Testament. We find it in Isaiah chapter 8, and if we read just at verse 16, this is the prophet Isaiah speaking to God's people Israel, and he says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law, here it is, among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And there, in verse 16, the word law literally means teaching, and the connection, therefore, with the word disciples is clearly in line with that overall definition with which we began. In these verses... The prophet Isaiah is protesting to God's people, the Jews, about their need to remain faithful to God's ways in the face of actually what's going to happen, which is an impending invasion by the Assyrian armies. And incidentally, this chapter (coughs) is a chapter in which the prophet makes mention of his two children, one of whom has the longest name in the whole of the Bible, uh, Mea Shalal Hashbaz. Imagine going to school with a name like that. Um, So what a name. I don't know what he was called for sure, but we'll speculate on that another time. <laughs> Having been uh, seen there then, the only occurrence of the word disciple in the Old Testament, we understandably find the main usage of the word is in the New Testament, in the Gospel records of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But don't worry, we're not going to try and go through all of them today. Instead, we're going to concentrate in the Gospel record of John to see the teaching which Jesus gave to his disciples. We're going to look 
at particular principles in the teaching, not uh, so much at what the disciples did or the incidents in which they were involved, all of which are known quite well to us. After all, if we want to learn what discipleship in Christ means, then we must understand his teaching, because disciples follow teaching. So let's go to John chapter 8, if we may, please. John chapter 8, <clears throat> and at verse uh, 31, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So there, in the early part of verse 31, we pick up this qualification of being a disciple, which once again agrees with that basic definition with which we began. These Jews, to whom Jesus was speaking, John tells us that they believed in Jesus, in the things that he was teaching them. And if you look back over the preceding verses in the chapter, you'll find that Jesus had been talking about his relationship with God as the Son of God. The God of the Jews, the one that they claimed to worship, uh, had sent his Son to them, and he was even now speaking with them, and some of them <coughs> believed that what he was telling them or explaining to them was true. So from this one situation then, we see that belief in the things which Jesus was teaching, the things that he said that he did, are a prerequisite of being or becoming a disciple of his. So when Jesus teaches us that he is the Son of God, it's important to notice that nowhere does he ever say that he was God the Son, as so many churches around us today would claim with their Trinitarian doctrine. If we want to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, we can't change his teaching just to suit ourselves or to change the meaning of what he said to something which he never said. So very clearly we have to be focused on what he said and, and, and not try and twist it or change it to something that we would find perhaps more acceptable in some ways. Nowhere in the whole of the Bible is Jesus described as God the Son. And in fact, in the next chapter, if we go on, we have the record of Jesus performing a miracle uh, as a result of a man who had been born blind and he was given his sight. And his parents, of course, rejoiced along with him, whilst the Jews who were all around were opposed to Jesus. They cornered this man to investigate again just how this miracle had occurred. And during their interrogation, they accused him of being a disciple of Jesus. Let's have a look at this. Chapter 9, verse 27 this is the man speaking to these Jews who were accusing him. He said to them, I've told you already and you didn't hear. Why would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? And they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. So we see here the blind prejudice of these Jews who had devoted themselves to manipulating the laws that Moses had given to the people of Israel. They were manipulating those laws to their own material advantage. And now they were beginning to feel threatened by the new teaching which Jesus was bringing to the people. All the more so because he taught with authority and clearly had power to perform these wonders and miracles and signs which all added weight to his teaching things which they, of course, couldn't do. And in this, I think we find um, another qualification for becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Some might also say that here we find one of the penalties of becoming a disciple, which we'll explore in a little while. You see, it's no good feeling self-satisfied or self-assured or simply trusting in your own status, position or wealth or, or anything else of that sort. Yes, you need to count the cost. This is an aspect of the teaching of Jesus, which we should come back to, as we've said, in a while. Incidentally, there in verse 29 of this chapter, we see a reference to Moses' disciples. And again, that fits our basic description of disciples. These were those who claimed to follow the laws and the teachings um, which Moses had proclaimed, laws which were given by God to his people through Moses. The truth of the matter, however, was that they were not prepared to follow as disciples those teachings which had been given to them through Moses. Those teachings, of course, were from God himself. And they had misused, misapplied, 
and even abuse them for their own personal ease and personal gain. So let's move on uh, to John chapter 13 for now. John chapter 13, and we're going to see Jesus' words at verse 34. Uh, Jesus says here, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved, have loved one to another. So here is Jesus contrasting for his hearers those things which the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews at the time, had been teaching with, as he calls it, a new commandment. So much of what had been good and holy teaching, which had been enshrined in the law of Moses, as we've already said, had been perverted to the extent that it created great burdens on the people. Uh, everyone who tried to follow those laws the um, leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes had imposed extra burdens and more burdens on top of those and burdens on burdens as it were um, all to do with uh, cementing their own authority and protecting their own position but oppression, says Jesus, is now to give way to love love for each other love for the true and pure teachings of God which he had come to bring afresh to everyone's attention <laughs> And in this we find another aspect of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The love for each other of which Jesus spoke at this time, he also qualified by saying that, as we've read, disciples' love for one another should be just as he had loved them. And to what extent did he show his love for his disciples? Well, he died for them upon a wooden cross. And that's the measure of the love which his disciples here are asked to strive both to understand and then to aim for themselves in their own lives. Now when we turn over in John chapter 15 we find what is often called the litmus test of a true disciple. Just, just turn over with me and see the words of Jesus in the next chapter. John 15 and at verse uh, 12. Again, he says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Well, we've just seen that previously in the, in the earlier chapter. 13, he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. So here's Jesus developing that previous teaching that we saw in chapter 13, explaining that no one is able to display a greater love for someone else than to be prepared to give his own life for that friend, that person. And clearly, in these words, Jesus counts disciples as his friends. And the litmus test is there in verse 14. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. So with these words before us, we have what is perhaps the most telling test for each one of us. If we want to be disciples or friends of Jesus, then we must learn to live by the commandments for life which Jesus gave in his teaching. Uh, and there is an assurance uh, from Jesus too, if we are able to learn to live this way. Uh, and perversely, we're going to go backwards through this chapter now for a few moments. So if we go back to verse 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So if you can achieve this, says Jesus, you will be loved by me, just as I am loved by my Father in heaven, in my obedience to his will and his commandments. Now this is no easy recipe, is it? And we should comment perhaps some more of that in a little while. But whilst we're here in John chapter 15, let's continue going backwards for a moment. Back to verse 8 of the chapter. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Um, we have another qualification here, don't we, of being a true disciple. Jesus says that we should bear much fruit, whatever that means. Well, the meaning is made clear for us if we go back a little further in the same chapter, back to verse 4. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So if you like, this was the analogy from which Jesus had developed the points that we've already seen in those verses a little later in the chapter. And you can quite easily understand the literal sense of his words here, can't you? Any branch or stem of a plant derives its sustenance from the goodness which the root system brings into the whole plant. And in precisely the same way, anyone who derives their sustenance for life, their food or fuel for the way that they live, from the example of Jesus' own life, uh, will be found to be abiding in him. There is, of course, a whole lot more behind those particular words of Jesus in that he uses this special analogy of the vine and its branches, and that's a whole study in itself for another time with the help of a concordance which you might like to undertake. So then, we've already picked up quite a few pointers here, I think, as to what discipleship is all about. We need to recognise that Jesus is the Son of God. We need to understand that when he talked about disciples loving one another, he meant to the extent that he loved them, even to giving his life for them. We need to appreciate the things which Jesus taught as being the principles by which we should organise our lives. The style of our lives must be a reflection of the style of his life. So it goes without saying then that his followers will be honest and decent people, but we already recognise that there's more to it than simply that. Anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ must also learn that there's a whole lot more. And to example this, let's go back now to Luke's Gospel just for a moment. Luke's Gospel and chapter 9, please. In Luke chapter 9, some well-known words, in verse 23, Jesus says to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For, what, for whosoever should be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. So here we are introduced to a deeper recognition of the reality of discipleship. It's not enough simply to live by a set of rules and regulations or commandments. This particular teaching of Jesus is perhaps better understood when we hear the literal translation of some of these words from the original Greek texts, which I'd like to share with you. Um, particularly um, verse 20, 23. If any man will follow after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross of himself daily and follow me. Now that's quite a different understanding, isn't it? It helps us to realise that what Jesus is telling us all is that before we can even begin to follow him, we must recognise ourselves for what we truly are, sinful people with this inbuilt proneness to committing sins, and then therefore recognise our need of him as our saviour. The weight of our own human nature is something that, having recognised it for what it is, we need to bear each and every day, looking at the example for living which Jesus gave us. So I think that literal, literal translation helps a little bit in clarifying what he's trying to say. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he committed no sin. He bore the weight of his own human nature daily and went to the cross in obedience to his Father's will. His death, the sacrifice of a perfect sinless man, provided a way for you and me to be reconciled with God, our Father in heaven. As far as our own lives are concerned, we can all think of things, I guess, with which we could perhaps live without things perhaps that we ought not to be involved with. We can all think about our own particular weaknesses and see that we must learn to deny self in this context. Just come on while we're in Luke to chapter 14. Uh, just one verse I want to pick up there for us. 
chapter 14 of Luke and verse uh, 26. This is, this is the extent of self-denial now. Jesus says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, whoa, he cannot be my disciple. At first, those are very daunting words, aren't they? I'm not exhorting us all to go home and hate our wives or husbands or children at all. Jesus, you see, knows our human nature so well and he recognises the close ties which exist in families based upon our very nature. Yet he tells us here that if we find the blessings associated with being his disciple are attractive to us, then we must put this above all else, including family bonds if necessary. Of course, <coughs> the greatest blessing in this life uh, is to be found when the whole of a family uh, has taken on board the idea of being disciples of Jesus because then the tensions and the problems that might otherwise arise can be faced and shared together. If, however, the family or any individual member of the family is against us in our decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must be clear that a true disciple will choose to follow Jesus rather than appease the family. It's a hard lesson. In this chapter, Jesus goes on to create examples of people who carefully count the cost before setting out on their chosen projects in order to ensure that they've got sufficient resources to complete the task that they decided to undertake. And he's not simply referring, of course, to financial resources. In the context of true discipleship, we may require significant resources of an emotional kind. We may need to face up to the fact that a serious illness must not hold us back we may find that the very person we love so deeply is unable to share our conviction. But whatever the test, the promise is the same. And we'll come to that in a minute or two. In this chapter, Luke chapter 14, there is a further challenge which Jesus gives to all who would follow him. And it's in verse 33. So likewise, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, before you all think of rushing out to sell or give away everything that you've got, give it all to the poor, that isn't exactly what he meant or what he said. With all of these words put together, we need to see them in the context of all of Jesus' teaching throughout the Gospel records. And the word there, forsaketh, can also be translated as renounce. So whatever our possessions are, great or small, whatever they happen to be, what Jesus is asking us all to do is to thank God for them all as our blessings, but not let any of them at all get in the way of our following his commands, his way for living. If we do possess things that could in any way hinder us in following Jesus, well, then perhaps we should think about getting rid of them. Generally, we need to keep all of these things in a proper perspective. Nothing should get in the way or take control of us so that we cannot give service to God as true disciples, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might just be asking yourself whether or not we are right to be thinking of ourselves as disciples today now that Jesus is no longer here with us on the earth. Well, in the record of the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 1, we read about Jesus ascending to heaven after his uh, resurrection, watched by, at the time, a group of his disciples, the apostles, and this was the point at which he departed from the earth to be with God his Father in heaven, where he is today, and will be, until God reaches the time for him to return to the earth. This time, of course, not as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, but as a king. Uh, who will welcome his faithful disciples into an everlasting worldwide kingdom uh, with Ju Jerusalem as its capital. And the features of the kingdom, of course, will be righteousness and peace and security. He will even raise to life again those disciples who have died before he comes. And the kingdom will last forever. These are all clear Bible teachings, promises from God himself about what lies ahead in, we believe, the near future. And later, in Acts chapter 1, we find the Apostle Peter is speaking. And he says this to his audience in Acts chapter 1, and verse 15. 
It says, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, notice the context, and said, uh, by the way, the number of them were about 120 at the time, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. So clearly, here, at this point, Peter is speaking to a good number of disciples. 120 of them are mentioned, and the scripture definitely refers to them as disciples. Just turn on with me to Acts chapter 6. Uh, just a few pages on. Chapter 6, and the first verse of that chapter, we read, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Greeks against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Verse 7, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So, once again, we see here in the Bible, the inspired word of God, calling those followers of the teachings of Jesus, disciples. So we have good reason then to believe that the term can still be applied today to any of us who truly put our hearts and minds into following the teaching of our Lord. In fact, in the context of these verses here in the Acts of the Apostles, it's very clear that there were multitudes of disciples at that time. Well, back in John's Gospel, we saw that disciples needed to be steadfast. You remember we read, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. This continuance requires a steadfastness in each one of us. So to bring us towards a conclusion of these thoughts, I want us just to consider some aspects of the blessings which are associated and promised to those who decide to follow Jesus. Just come back again to John chapter 8 with me. John chapter 8, and we read at verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's quite a frequent thing to speak about today's society as an age of darkness, isn't it? A society which, by and large, is not illuminated by the light of the gospel message which is contained here in the Bible. Jesus described himself on more than one occasion as the light of the world. And here in this verse, he promises those who decide to follow him that they shall have the light of life. Let's continue this idea over in chapter 10 and at verse 25. Uh, here Jesus answered the people and said, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So using a different analogy now, Jesus says that of the, he's speaking about the sheep and the shepherd, that analogy, and he's making a similar point for us here, isn't he? Those of us who really are trying to be his disciples, his sheep in this context, will hear his voice. And his words are recorded here in the pages of the Bible so that we may read them at any time or in any place and listen to what he requires of us. In a sense, those words that we read by way of introduction from Paul's letter to the Ephesians uh, encapsulate for us, I think, both the challenge and the rewards, the promised rewards, for disciples. The rewards are promised not at simply some point in the future, you know, could be any time, we don't know how long. It's not like that. The rewards are promised for this life, as well as sometime in the future. Just, just check again with me in Ephesians chapter 5, would you? Uh, and the first uh, couple of verses there. Paul writes, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, there's that theme again, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. So here in the opening verse, Paul has latched right onto the theme that we've been developing. Uh, in John's Gospel record. And he goes on in verses 3 to 5, as we read together earlier, 
to enumerate a list of things which true disciples will have absolutely nothing to do with. And then when we get down to verse 6 through 13, we find Paul also picks up on the contrast between the darkness of this world and the light of the true teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the challenge of these words to true disciples of Jesus Christ is to avoid association with the wickedness of this world, its ways, and to some extent, its people. There are, in fact, many people today who claim to be disciples of Christ. They might claim to be born-again Christians. And yet, if you look closely at their lives or their lifestyle, there are things which they do or say or attitudes that they display which really don't quite fit with what the Bible tells us is expected of a disciple. And this is what Paul has called here in verse 11 the unfruitful works of darkness, which at all costs we should avoid. Now, what we haven't done this, year, this afternoon is simply make a, a list of all the things that we shouldn't do as disciples of Jesus Christ, nor have we made a second list of all the things that we should do, because what we do isn't the measure. The true measure of a disciple is found in what kind of person they are. What sort of attitudes do they display towards other people? What sort of characters have they developed? And if we've got these things right, then the things that we do will actually demonstrate and give evidence to that fact. In fact, if we've got these things right, we shall bear much fruit. That's what we wanted to find out, wasn't it? That was what Jesus said he expects of his disciples, that they should bear much fruit. So the challenge of true discipleship is a hard one. The ideals are set there for us and they provide a very high standard. And whilst we all try to follow, we also all regularly fail. And in this, God is proven to be a very gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, as we were talking about earlier this morning. For he will forgive our failings if we recognise them and ask for his forgiveness in our prayers to him through Jesus Christ. So just as the standards are demanding, the promised reward is absolutely glorious. Come with me to Matthew 25 uh, for probably our final reference, I think. We've seen the analogy, haven't we, of Jesus as a shepherd and we as his sheep, uh, something that we've thought about already. Uh, but let's close our thoughts with that same analogy. Matthew and chapter 25, please. Uh, and at verse 31, this is what we read. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, the sheep, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. So this is the time when Jesus will have returned to the earth and he will come as judge. And clearly, as we read, there will be people in the category of either being sheep or goats. The sheep, Jesus' true disciples, we've seen already, uh, that's the description of them. And the promise is held out to you and to me. If we are in that category, if we are following in the ways of Jesus as his disciples, his sheep, the promise that is held out is very, very clear, isn't it? He says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world.